Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Thursday of the month, which means it's time for Vegan Doc Talk with Dr. Scott Harrington. And today he's going to be talking about a very important subject that we have a lot of questions about, which is understanding your lab tests. Because if you're healthy and following a vegan or a whole food plant-based diet, sometimes the numbers are really normal. Normal, but because you're being compared to a population that's generally overweight and sick, it, a non-vegan doctor may not understand that. So he's going to demystify your lab tests. Please welcome Dr. Scott Harrington. How are you doing? All right, Chef AJ, thanks for that awesome introduction. And once again, I'm so humbled to be here on your show. I feel super lucky and I uh, get a chance to you know talk about vegan primary care and I get to help out the patients too uh, and uh, your subscribers. So thanks again for having me on. And uh, I, I think it's a great topic today. Shall I, I think so too, because one of the things that I, I'm not, I don't want to like, like, no, it, no, go ahead. But one of the things that I hear, like, I mean, I think vegans are health conscious people. Dr. Doug Lyle lovingly calls them HCNCs, hyperconscientious nutcases. And so if there's, there's is off, like for like one little number, they'll be upset, but it's actually normal is it's normal for their diet. And so they'll worry about things like protein or sodium. But the thing I hear a lot in this, and I, I, I'm not a doctor, but I can almost answer in a non-doctor way is that they will tell us because we have low total cholesterol compared to the average population. So mine is like, for example, 99. Well, if my total nice. cholesterol is low and my LDL is 57, of course, my HDL is low. And I already exercise like a crazy person. And they're like saying, well, you got to raise your HDL. And the way I heard it explained is that HDL is like the garbage trucks. And if you don't have garbage, you don't need a lot of garbage trucks. So I, I hope that you'll explain that because I think they may worry sometimes about numbers that are actually really normal and good, but but because we're being compared to people that are abnormal, we're told there's something wrong with our numbers. I love it. I love it. I mean, you have, uh, you're so smart and you've done this and uh, you've heard it from so many experts and everything that, um, you know, you put it in a really great way. I love the garbage truck analogy because that's really easy to understand. And, you know, um, yeah, if you're, if your overall cholesterol is really low, you don't need too many garbage trucks. I love it. I um, one of the big, I mean, just before we start, white blood cells and platelets tend to be lower in vegans. And, and that's, um, those are kind of markers of inflammation. Those, and if you eat a diet high in fruits and vegetables loaded with phytonutrients and fiber, then you are going to have low levels of inflammation in your body and your white blood cells don't have to work as hard, basically. So uh, that's kind of the big one with vegans. Uh, most, many of the other labs are, are, are very similar, honestly. And, uh, and we're going to go over some basic lab work today that most doctors uh, when you go to a doctor, a typical doctor visit that you will get, what they mean, and uh, and uh, just so that you don't leave uh, after getting your labs feeling so confused. Honestly, it can be it can be confusing. So let's go ahead here. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if this works out. All right. So uh, Chef AJ, you're going to have to let me know if this all works out. Are you seeing my picture? I sure am. Nice photo, by the way. Very nice. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Harrington. I run a practice called Vegan Primary Care, where you can see me in person if you live in the Tampa area or around, around Florida, or you can see me online through telemedicine through most U.S. states. We can do labs and referrals, and I could be your primary care doctor. Uh, here are Here's the map. Here's the laydown. So it's kind of most states west of the Mississippi, I've started to lose a few states where I didn't have patients. I haven't kept my license up, but many, many states that I, that I uh, have. And, um, and I see patients from all around. This is real exciting. I do accept insurance. Here we go. Aetna, Cigna, TRICARE, Medicare. Here's a program that I do that I really enjoy. This is one of my babies. This is uh, Get to Your Goal Weight Loss. Uh, it's a weekly free meeting where we meet and we talk about what went right in our plant-based journey and we, we name our wins. So this, this is an exciting free thing that my patients have access to every week at 7 p.m. Eastern. So uh, coming up, I'm going to be involved in the Holistic Holiday at Sea Cruise. I'm going to be one of the speakers. So I'm super lucky, super humbled to be doing that. 
And so if any of the subscribers are hearing there and you're, they're going to be on the Holistic Holiday at Sea, I can't wait to meet you. Right. So today we're going to talk about lab work. We're going to talk about basic lab work. And this is what I'd like to call the lab work journey. Okay, stick here with me. First, you've got to convince your doctor to order your labs. And, you know, you might be have something that you're interested in testing. And so you, you kind of have to convince your doctor, and that can be kind of a pain. And, you know, there can be some medical jargon, and it can be confusing. So then, okay, so you get your lab work from your doctor, the order, then you got to schedule it and you've got to fast and you've got to fit it into your busy schedule and it's a real pain. And then when you get there, then it's, you know, it's kind of nerve wracking because getting your blood drawn and, and then dealing with long wait times at the, at the lab. Uh, and then the idea of wondering what the costs are because it can be very confusing, very um, non-transparent about what the costs are if you're doing insurance labs. Then you're waiting for the results. And it's kind of an agonizing wait because if you're really worried about some sort of health ill, you know, medical disease, you could be quite alarmed and, and, and stressed. And then the doctor calls you and kind of gives you an explanation. And you may see that there's some results where it's a little bit off and it gets even more confusing. And then in the end, the doctor explains it to you and you don't really feel like you're any smarter than you were before. And uh, you're just more confused. And so, I, I mean, to me, this feels kind of like the standard story of, of getting your labs drawn. And so I was trying to do this talk to kind of go over some of these things. So which lab should I get? How often should I get labs? What does it cost? What do the labs mean? And what can't be tested and what can be tested and the problems associated. So full disclosure, most labs for screening are not recommended. Most labs for screening are not recommended. And that is, that's kind of hard to believe because um, the US Preventative Task Force provides recommendations for certain testing. And the most tests, except for things like STD and infectious type screening is not really recommended. It's uh, sometimes it can even be harmful uh, in the instance for certain tests. But Lab tests, of course, come into play if you're actually trying to figure something out. If you feel like you're fatigued, something's wrong, you want to try to get some information, then, then it makes sense to go get some labs from your doctor. And it also makes sense if you're monitoring a disease like diabetes, or if you have high cholesterol or thyroid disease, and you want to know. And when should you just start getting labs? Well, really, it's, it's as a young adult, 18 to 21 might be a reasonable time to get your first lab. Not that you're going to be super ill at that time, but um, it's good to get a relationship with a doctor in case you need things like STD testing and that sort of thing, which are um, recommended by the U.S. Preventative Task Force. Okay, a big thing to ask yourself when getting a lab and ask your doctor, why are we getting this test? What are we going to do if it's positive or negative? If you, if you are not going to do something, whether it's positive or negative, this, it's a good idea to not do the test, honestly. And this kind of feels weird. This feels weird because sometimes more information, you know, you can lead to more testing and more um, uh, stress and anxiety. And so game plan the results, game plan the results. What are you going to do if it's positive or negative? I, I definitely recommend that. And you can save yourself money and time and, and labs and, uh, and a lot of heartache. Okay. How much does it cost? Is it worth it? Um, remember, if you're taking it from the doctor's perspective, there can be some pressures to order more because of this uh, frustrating story that I told you before. Oh, you're driving to it. You're making a schedule. You're having to fast. It's, it's kind of a pain to go get labs drawn. So many labs will have a follow-up lab. For instance, if your bilirubin is high, you might do something called a fractionated bilirubin, you know, additional testing. And as a doctor, you don't want to have to keep uh, sending your patient back to the lab all the time. So you feel compelled to order a bunch of tests. So that's why you get there to the lab and you're, you know, it's like they're a vampire taking all your blood, right? <laughs> so um, the other big problem with labs is if they're just mildly off, 
here or there, low or high. It could just be local variation or mild changes. Many labs will have a big shift in the circadian rhythm and time of the day so they can be off slightly and it can, it can create confusion. Okay, just down to the brass tacks, what are the typical labs that I tend to order in vegan primary care? And this is what most doctors order. This is what most, I, this is complete blood count. This is the, uh, an anemia check where it goes over your actual blood, uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, stuff like that. Comprehensive metabolic panel is the electrolytes, liver and kidney, and lipids, cholesterol, thyroid panel, this thyroid hormone and the thyroid stimulating hormone. Hemoglobin A1C is the long-term blood sugar test. B12 and vitamin D. These are the vitamins that I recommend that uh, all my patients take, vitamin B12 and vitamin D. So that's why I test them. And especially as vegans, it's a good idea to get your B12 tested. Additional labs. Okay, so with B12, B12 comes a follow-up test called homocysteine and methylmalonic acid. If you're kind of on the border or if you're low, it's a good idea to test these. These are uh, uh, tests that uh, show the metabolism of B12 and they may build up uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. This is an inflammatory marker. And this goes along with other lipids like lipoprotein A and apolipoprotein B. These are uh, lipids and inflammatory markers that can help you decide whether you need to be more aggressive in your treatment of cholesterol. Rheumatoid panel, you know, many patients have, will have um, an achy joints, they'll wake up and feel achy, and then when you get worried, they have autoimmune disease, so you test with a rheumatoid panel. It's, uh, oftentimes, folks will be interested in knowing their hormone levels. Um, in general, I kind of discourage taking many hormones unless uh, there's very specific indications. Uh, celiac antibody testing is for uh, gluten intolerance and, and celiac disease. So uh, that is something that gets tested and omega-3 frequent, frequently gets requested. Okay, let's get down to business. What are the costs of these labs? Well, I'm very lucky at having my own practice. I have an account with Quest, it's a client account with Quest, and I can order these labs very cheaply. So Quest charges me this price, and I turn around and basically charge that price for the patient, and you can get as many or as little as these that you'd like. Um, and But there are, so for, for $110, you can get all these tests that we put on that kind of typical panel. Um, but notice there are others, lots of things popping up, direct labs, labs that you can just order as the patient without having to have a doctor in the, in the middle, you know, you can find it out yourself. So this is, this is great, but the prices are way more expensive, uh, I've found. With insurance, I don't know about you, Chef AJ, but insurance is a minefield. I don't know if you've had to deal with big bills and that you didn't expect and deductibles and you're not sure. There's no transparency. And um, oftentimes as a doctor, I'll order something the patient wants and then come to find out later on, oh, this wasn't covered. This wasn't covered. You know, For instance, vitamin D is a big one that a lot of times the insurance companies will balk at. And uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is my favorite blood sugar test, is oftentimes not covered unless you're diabetic. So at first you have to do a glucose and then you have to do the um, diabetes uh, hemoglobin A1C. Okay, okay, full disclosure, full disclosure. This is Dr. Harrington's lab test from Quest. So here are, here are my tests from January, 2021. So here is, you know, Chef AJ, you talked about your cholesterol. Here's mine. You, you've got me beat. Your total cholesterol is 99. I'm 130. Well, that, was, that was one time. I mean, that, you know, it's been 124. It's been 106. I mean, it's not always 99, but when it was, they were like, oh, you're going to, you know, they, they were like worried, you know? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It is funny. You know, cholesterol does kind of go up and down and it can, you know, I've had worse cholesterols and, uh, and, and here it is. My HDLs, you know, my overall cholesterol is really low, but um, HDL is really low as well. So, um, you know, I'd like that to be higher, but once again, you don't need garbage trucks if, if there's no garbage to pick up in, in your, uh, 
in your artery. So that's good. Ideally, you want your LDL to be 70 or less, ideally, ideally. Depending if you have diabetes, you may even want it to be lower. Okay, so yeah, when we're ordering a lipid panel, I tend to focus on LDL. Now there's lots of new information about lipids and, um, and which ones we should look at. And there's fractionated lipids where you get the different sizes and it can be all um, confusing. Um, but most of the algorithms are based on LDL. So LDL is still one that we focus on. Uh, this is from Thomas Dayspring. This is a really cool slide because honestly, lipids are pretty confusing, uh, but it kind of puts it out in a uh, very um, uh, more easy to understand. Um, there's two, there's ApoB lipoproteins and ApoA1 lipoproteins. And the HDL, the, the ApoA lipoproteins are non-atherogenic and the ApoB pro lipoproteins are atherogenic. Uh, and so, but here's how the total cholesterol is broken down. Total cholesterol is HDL plus LDL and plus VLDL, very low density lipoprotein. Okay, so these are these two other tests we mentioned here from Dr. Harrington, my lipoprotein A and my high sensitivity CRP. So I'm lucky because my lipoprotein A is also very low. And this is a genetic... Uh, uh, a lab marker. Uh, if it's if it's high, it tends to be kind of stable most of your life. Uh, the lipoprotein A, high sensitivity CRP is a marker of inflammation, and we'll talk more about that. So here's a picture once again from Thomas Dayspring, the amazing lipidologist. Uh, very similar to an LDL particle, okay, but it also has uh, this thing on the side, ApoA, and so it, it changes it. But we do know that this one is uh, genetic and it also increases your risk for atherosclerosis. Um, so if you've had someone in your family who had a heart attack, a male before 55 or a female before 65, you may ask, want to add, tell your doctor, hey, get my lipoprotein A level so I can know uh, if I have additional risk. Okay, what is this HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein? This is a molecule, molecule actually produced by the liver. It's a part of what we call the innate immune system. The innate immune system is kind of like your defenses as opposed to the adaptive immune system, which is kind of like your offense, immune system's offense. So um, created by the liver and used for various, uh, various immune functions, but it is a marker of inflammation because if there's damaged tissue, your body will use have this... Um, uh, be producing more of this. Uh, so it is a marker of inflammation, a marker of cardiovascular disease. Uh, this is one of the schematics that Quest uses in their Quest Cardio IQ report. And they have HSCRP as one of the markers of inflammation. So you'll hear the, about these other ones, oxidized LDL, um, LP, PLA2 activity, myeloperoxidase, ADMA. This, so, uh, but this one is a relatively cheap test, HSCRP, and it's one that you can follow over time. So it's a general marker of inflammation. It's kind of nice to, nice to have. Okay, back to Dr. Harrington's blood test. Here we go. This is the complete blood count, including differential. And this one is a, a big consternation for a lot of folks because there's so many labs and you'll end up Googling what does MCV mean and MCH and all, all this stuff. It, and it can be quite confusing, especially if you're off a little bit of here or there. And so um, this is actually testing the different um, populations of the cells. So the, the red blood cells, which look like the little red donuts, the white blood cells, which are stained purple here. Um, and you can see there's various different types of white blood cells. And this is what the differential is all about. This is why it has uh, all the percentages of these and it goes over platelets as well. So back to the CBC, complete blood count, you can see white count, red count, hemoglobin and hematocrit. 
the hemoglobin and hematocrit are actually what Dr. Harrington's looking at when I'm looking at your, your, you know, when a doctor looks at your labs and they just breeze through, boom, 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 boom. That's because there are certain things that they're really looking at. And for instance, hemoglobin and hematocrit is a big test for anemia. MCV, mean corpuscular volume. We're going to talk more about that too. For instance, the hematocrit is actually the packed red blood cells. It's how high the packed red blood cells are when it's spun down, the blood is spun down and the plasma is up at the top and the red blood cells are at the bottom. It's how high the red blood cells are as a percentage of that height. So when you're anemic, they spin down your blood, you don't have very many of the red blood cells there. And then when you have polycythemia, if you've been, uh, if your blood, bone marrow produces too much, uh, too many red blood cells, if you are having lack of oxygen at night from obstruct, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, your body will produce more of these red blood cells. Uh, training at training at altitude, stuff like that will actually do it too. Mean corpuscular volume. This is another test that helps lead doctors, doctors into know whether you have anemia for reasons of B12 deficiency and you have macrocytic blood, large red blood cells or microcytic blood from iron deficiency, anemia, and, and various other things, small blood cells, MCV. That's what that's all about. And the differential, the differential of the complete blood count talks about the different white blood cells. And so you'll see here, they have the absolute numbers and then they have uh, the percentages. And most of the time, this is, the levels might be off a tiny bit here or there. And, it's, and most of the time it's not uh, concerning dramatically concerning, but in certain leukemias and infections and stuff, it can help clue the doctor in that, oh my gosh, you have uh, this type of um, uh, lymphomas or something. You'll have uh, uh, the, the different white blood cells will be much higher in a certain percentage and that can help uh, the doctor understand that. Okay. Comprehensive metabolic panel. This is the electrolytes, the liver, the kidney. This is the part one, just the top. This is the electrolytes. And I've got to tell you, you know, we always order this, but um, people end up taking more information out of this than they probably should as an outpatient. And what I mean by that is as an inpatient, a lot of times you're getting fluid in the arm and you'll be testing your electrolytes because the fluid going straight into the arm messes up the electrolytes. It, um, normally the body keeps these very stable like pH and temperature. So it's uh, a lot of times when I see uh, sodium, potassium, chloride, or something slightly out of whack as an outpatient, I know that by the time if I get more labs again, it will be it will have changed. So the big things that I'm looking at and the, the, the metabolic panel here is the, the blood sugar, the glucose, and the creatinine, okay? Creatinine is a marker of your kidney function. Uh, creatinine is a, a, a muscle breakdown product and uh, the kidney uh, filters it out. So if the kidney's not working, the creatinine will build up and it will relate to the glomerular filtration rate. That's what they, uh, how they define kidney disease. So luckily mine's in the normal range. Okay, so this is the part two of the comprehensive metabolic panel. And this is, you'll see protein, albumin, globulin, all this is quite confusing. The ones I'm really looking at are the AST and ALT. These are the liver enzymes. And so commonly these are positive related to fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome because the liver plays a big role in this. And so this is one of the things that I, I, I'll frequently monitor. The albumin and the globulin and the various proteins, a lot of times us as vegans, we worry that, uh, you know, if this is slightly off or something, we're worrying that we're not getting enough protein. And th this is a liver, uh, a liver protein. And it, it can be misleading. It can be slightly off and you can be like, uh, like some sort of self-fulfilling uh, worry. Like I knew I wasn't eating enough protein. Oh my gosh. No, it's not like that. So don't, don't think about it like that. Make sure you're um, getting enough protein. Make sure you're having beans and grains and that kind of thing in your diet um, and you'll be fine. But uh uh, this should not be your indicator for whether you're getting enough protein or not, like weight loss and, and um, uh, loss of muscle mass and stuff like that should be uh, more of an indicator for you. Okay, 
This is a huge one, hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C, glycolated hemoglobin. I call this like sugar donuts or the amount of cars in your fleet that are rusted. So blood sugar will affect the hemoglobin and will actually attach to hemoglobin A, uh, one of the uh, several hemoglobin uh, molecules. Um, and so glucose will uh, attach to it. And for the life of the red blood cell, it will be glyc glycated. And so you can determine how high your blood sugar is based on the percentage of glycated hemoglobin, the rusted cars in your fleet, or the sugar donuts. And so you can use a, um, you can infer that your average glucose is by the, what, what the percentage of the hemoglobin A1C is. So there's a very good uh, direct correlation. And I really like this because with blood sugar, blood sugar goes up and down up and down, up and down. But the, the hemoglobin A1C is a nice long-term test. It's uh, kind of one of the things doctors used to call it the lie detector blood sugar test, kind of. If people say, oh, my blood sugar was great. <laughs> okay, coming towards the end here, the, the vitamin D, I was low, I was low. I had to start supplementing. I was trying to use uh, my the sunshine as, as my, my, main, my main vitamin D uh, supplier. However, I'm fair and I, I wear my sunscreen and my hats and uh, I was low. So I had to, I had to up my, up my supplementation. Um, you can see here, Quest will tell you right off the bat. It says, make sure uh, uh, between 20 and 30 is considered insufficiency. And you wanna be over 30. B12, as a vegan, I would for, sometimes just forget to take my B12. And honestly, I needed to kick it up a notch. And so, you really want to be over 400 because Quest will tell you right here in the little write-up, it says five to 10% of patients between two and 400 will experience some symptoms of B12 deficiency. So up your numbers. Now you don't want to be off the charts high. Uh, and, and so definitely uh, take your B12. You might find you're having a problem with absorption and you might need to increase your dose. Folate, the second part of this test, honestly, it's almost never low almost never low, and except for people who are anorexic or an, uh, alcoholics who just weren't, aren't eating, they'll have low folate as well. So this is the thing we're usually checking, B12. Homocysteine and methylmalonic acid are double checkers. They check to see your, the actual metabolic, uh, these are um, things that will build up if you're not utilizing uh, B12 appropriately. So methylmalonic acid is more specific for B12, and homocysteine is B12, folate, and um, B6 as well. So those are the things you can use to get your homocysteine down. Almost done here with the labs. We're talking about thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone, mine was in the proper range here. Some would say it should be even lower, 2.5. And so the thing that's confusing about thyroid, and this is the reason why I wanted to bring it up, is the fact that high TSH means low thyroid. And that's because of the feedback. I like to think of thyroid stimulating hormone like the volume knob. The volume knob, how much the body wants to have the thyroid hormone. It's a, or the thyroid shouting hormone because uh, the pituitary gland will shout down with the thyroid hormone to tell the thyroid to perk up, produce more thyroid. And so, um, and you'll see there that as, as thyroid hormone is produced, it will inhibit, it will inhibit additional release of thyroid stimulating hormone. So when you're thinking about thyroid stimulating hormone, think about it as a volume knob, how much the body wants. And if it's over 10, that is clear. Oh my gosh, you need thyroid hormone, thyroid hormone. If it's over 4.5, then it's this subclinical level. And you have to talk with your doctor about whether you should supplement with thyroid hormone. But that's the reason why if it's over 4.5, that many people are put on it. And maybe you should just retest, just retest and see how you do. Okay. Last kind of uh, point here is the idea that we've got more control over our health with home tests than we ever had. Like now you can buy urine tests. Uh, you can find out, you know, whether you're having a, you know, you feel like some burning you want to know, are you having infection? You can just do a quick dipstick test. And these are pretty cheap, you know, maybe under $20 for a hundred tests. Um, 
there's blood sugar testing, there's continuous blood sugar monitors, there's fecal heme, heme testing called uh, fit testing, which you can test your stool for blood, things like that, do your own sort of colon cancer screening that way. Nitrate sticks to see, you know, how your levels are for, um, you know, eating greens, enough greens, nitrate sticks, COVID tests, pregnancy tests, all sorts of fun things. And I, I recommend that patients have this as a telemedicine doctor, that anything they can test uh, it would prevent us from having to send them to the, uh, to the lab. Things that can't be tested. Some folks have asked about things like serotonin for depression and um, or specific tests for like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. And there's no kind of direct test for, for these kind of things. Oftentimes syndromes are done by clinically. And um, another thing that's very common is patients ask me, hey, uh, I wanna get my various nutrients tested. And there are that are really validated like iron, B12, stuff like that. Um, but there are many that are not really validated that well, like um, zinc and selenium and stuff like that. And the, you can order these things, but you don't know where you are in the daily cycle and rhythm of the levels going up and down. And it, it can be confusing and you don't want to guide, use it to guide your treatment uh, because it could have been low or it could have been high and, and uh, it, it, it's variable. So many of the nutrients can be tough. When patients ask me about nutrients, I kind of turn them over to food logs like chronometer to try to do a, a one or two day log to kind of see where they're at uh, and make sure they're getting adequate uh, amounts. Okay, in conclusion, get a doctor who gets you. If you wanna get some labs, no problem. If you're in Tampa, come see me in person. Otherwise, uh, I'm available in 29 different states. Here are the states that I am available one more time. And thank you for your time. And I am ready to do some question and answer period. What do you think? Oh, Should, darn, you're, you're, do you think you'll ever get one in Maryland? I have somebody in Maryland that could see you. That would be great. I didn't uh, see Maryland on there. Let's see here. Well, okay. Maryland. Uh, I saw I, California. Do you have, do you have Washington DC? They could just hop over there. I know, I know. Sometimes my patients, you know, I don't have Maryland, and we, and right now we don't have Maryland on the an application out for Maryland. Unfortunately, I'm actually kind of paring down. I, you know, um, some of my if if I don't get patients in, in those states, eventually I have to let them go. Um, it's it's kind of sad. It's, it's always you always want to build up. You don't want to let things go, but it, it's uh, that's so interesting how that is because other countries, you know, our countries, they I don't think like you have to be like if you're in London versus you know Liverpool. You know what I mean? It's interesting how the United States how that happened that that you have to be a board. You know, you have to pass the test in every state instead of you know. I know, I know. I mean, and do you with know the why that is though? Is is there a legitimate reason? Because I remember when I'm, both my brothers are doctors, and when they went to medical school, that, that was a long time ago. They're older than me. They they got they they when they were fresh out and had the test, they took it in a bunch of different states, the states that they were thinking they might live in, because you know they they remembered stuff better at that point. Yeah, I, I think it has something to do with kind of business professional licensing, and and, and uh, you, you know like. Um, Salons will have you know a little license registration with the state, uh, and, and so the state can monitor certain um, like sanitation goals and uh, kind of like protecting the consumer kind of thing. I think that's probably a big deal about because certain states have certain um, uh, you know someone who's in Alaska might have different issues than someone in Hawaii, for instance, and or you know different different bugs, different uh, <laughs> parasites or something, you know, various, various things. So there, is, there are uh, starting to become nationwide uh, uh, rec reciprocities in certain states, uh, but you have to live in a state that is a, that has a reciprocal uh, licensing. So um, I happen to that Florida doesn't reciprocate. <laughs> so, so I had to do each one by itself. Yeah. No, no, thank you. So guys, you know, whenever we have a guest in general, but a doctor specifically, you got to send those questions in in advance. We only can go to the chat if there's time and we do have questions that were sent in first. So also please wait till the presentation's over because my chat is like a ticker tape and it goes away. It, I don't see it. So I'm going to ask the question that relates to the topic first, and then there's one that doesn't, and then we can go to the chat. So 
I, this question, I, I think, is part of a larger question. When you when your lab results are so slightly off, are they off? Because Faith is worried because her sodium, which is supposed to be 134 to 144, is 131. 131 is pretty close to 134. And her chloride, which is supposed to be 96 to 106, is 94. Again, it's like, you know, two points away. And the creatinine, which is supposed to be 0. 0.57 to 1, is 1.15. So when they're off, are they off? Or, I mean, I mean, should somebody worry when they're that minuscule off or... Um, well, okay, this is a great question, and I, I really, I feel like it's a failing of my, uh, my talk, because this was one of the big questions that I wanted to answer, uh, but finding, finding the, perfect, the perfect reference for this is, uh, is hard, because a lot of times it's clinical judgment uh, on each one of the tests, and this is why it's nice to have a doctor that you, um, you trust, and you feel like you can really, you know, um, drill down with them about certain things. Because there's there's um, small abnormalities, and then there is like the oh my gosh, this is really bad, you know, holy cow! Um, check yourself into the emergency room, you know. The, it, there's like uh, there's like green, yellow, red, you know, black, you know, like oh my gosh. Uh, so uh, for 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 a lot of times the electrolytes, like I was saying. The electrolytes might be different the next time you test because they are highly uh, variable and could be related to your activity or how long you fasted, whether you're dehydrated, whether you had a loose stool could affect your electrolytes. Um, so so th this kind of thing can, um, can affect it transiently. Now, I worry a little bit about the creatinine in terms of uh, creatinine is a kidney function marker. Now, that's not clearly off the charts, but with uh, creatinine, doctors tend to be a little bit more, their, um, their concern uh, is a little bit more on, on this uh, specific lab if it's slightly off. And so um, if something's slightly off with the creatinine and uh, I can't explain it very easily, I definitely make my recommend to the patient to get a double check double checker test. Um, but so many of the, the labs, if you have 20 or 30 labs, are going to be off one or two. And it, it just, it creates a, a lot of uh, stress and confusion. Right, great. We had a lot of questions today. So hopefully we'll get to as many as possible. But All I right. want to ask this one question that's not about lab tests, because we didn't know your topic. And just out of deference to the person that asked it, whose name is Laura, she says, I've been following the SOS whole food plant diet for almost a month. I want to clarify, guys, if you're on the SOS diet, that's not good. Then you're on the sugar oil salt diet. It's SOS free. So <laughs> I get that a lot. And I'm like, yeah, the SOS diet, that's a terrible diet. That's what that's like. you know. <laughs> that sounds like the standard American diet. Exactly. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> so it's SOS free. Um, and she said, I started the program. Since I started the program, I find myself waking up after four to five hours of sleep and unable to get back to sleep for a couple hours. Is this normal? I also lost nine pounds in the first week, and I know it was mostly fluid, but I have not lost anything since. Trying hard not to give up. I've been very faithful and have not had anything I should not. Can you help me? I wish people would actually submit their food diary when they say that, because as Dr. McDougall said, Monday, all dieters are liars. But, um, you know, anyway, so that's the question. Okay, so I mean, uh, to kind of restate the question, um, if I so that you know that I understand that you know that I know what you know is, is the idea that uh, she did started the SOS free diet and she started to lose weight, but then she's kind of hit a plateau. Is that what I'm quite understanding? Yeah, and she's waking up after four or five hours oh. and not able to go back to sleep. That's right. That's right. That's right. I mean, yeah, so sometimes people complain, uh, especially when they're dieting and they're eating less calories that, that they uh, are dealing with insomnia or they can't fall asleep unless they've got that bust the gut kind of feeling like, you know, oh my gosh, I ate so much food that like my body has to uh, work hard to digest it and I just fall right asleep or, you know, the uh, tryptophan is, is really, uh, my levels are off the chart or, or that kind of thing. And um, that's actually, I experienced that when I switched in 2012 to a plant-based diet, I kind of felt like I needed less sleep. And I, I, I think maybe there was just less inflammation in my body and I, I just felt more energized. But the other thing is that our sleep quality tends to erode a little bit as we get older. Uh, so it, 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 there is a, there is a, a small potential there that, um, that, you know, 
that, that, that might be one of the issues. I'm spending a lot of time with my patients trying to um, normalize, normalize the idea of sometimes you end up waking up in the middle of the night. You wake up in the middle of the night. The key though, is to not get yourself too amped up so that you can hopefully fall back asleep for maybe one or two hours right before uh, it's time to get up. Uh, and so you got to be real careful to make sure you're going to sleep early enough that you allow yourself enough time to, to have this um, additional sleep, two sleeps, kind of, if you think about it. Um, I try to normalize this effect because it's so common. It's so common. And so what are the alternatives? The alternatives, taking a sleep pill, pill to really knock you over the head and really, you know, knock you out all night is not ideal because one, sleep pills can be habit forming. And uh, two, sometimes it, it can, you know, alter your state of consciousness and this kind of thing. It's not, it's definitely not ideal. So we work on lifestyle fixes, one to normalize it and not, so it's not so anxiety provoking, like, oh my God, I can't sleep. Uh, and, and two, work on lifestyle fixes to try to do things that are calming, you know, maybe uh, reading, maybe um, using it as a time where it's just yourself. It's just most of the time throughout the day, there's so many requirements on you and you can't sit back and reflect. And so you can try to turn it around and think about that time, a little bit of time at night where you can just be with your own self and your thoughts. You could practice mindfulness, meditation, listen to guided relaxation things, do progressive muscle relaxation where you, you squeeze all your muscles in a progressive fashion that kind of helps to relax you. You know, um, these are things that I try to do to people and talk about and normalize the sort of two sleeps. Uh, now, in terms of hitting a plateau with weight loss uh, on the salt, oil, and sugar-free diet. I mean, you know, so we don't know what she's eating. She could be eating nuts or seeds or avocado or bread. You know, just because you're not eating sugar, oil, and salt doesn't mean that you can't uh, be overweight. Uh, so that's the thing. I'd like people to include a food diary of the last at least three days when they say they don't lose weight. Right. I think we're a good team, Chef AJ. I think, I <laughs> I can, think I'll be your medical, I'll be your medical assistant. <laughs> I think hey, I do have a special guest today. I do have a special guest. Of course, we want to answer more questions. But my special guest today is Mr. Oyster Mushroom. Look at that crazy mushroom. My oh God. my God. Is that really a mushroom? This is a mushroom. And I just, I had to show it today because I got this for Christmas. It was called uh, Back to the Roots Organic Mushroom Kit. And, uh, and because I love this kind of thing. And uh, I just, it's really fun. I don't have any uh, monetary, you know, I'm not getting paid by these guys. But it's really fun. Like, look at this in just a couple of days. This is and now I have to like face the music and actually try to eat these things, right? It's like, growing uh, out of the box. That's weird. It's growing straight out of the box. Look at that. You know, I got to say mushrooms creep me out. I, I, I know, right? <laughs> They are a freaky food if they are a food at all. The only way I can really get myself to eat them is either to air fry them or I get this soup in a local Vietnamese restaurant. He makes it SOS free and he actually makes noodles out of mushrooms. So he takes the large king oyster mushrooms and he makes it, and they look exactly like noodles and taste like noodles, but they don't have flowers. So that's how I eat my mushrooms. But mushrooms are creepy. I don't know. Cause I think so like creepy. Yeah, look yeah. at this one. Oh my gosh, it, it's it's uh, this one is uh, the blue oyster mushrooms, and that was the other one was pink. And I, I've got now I'm going to have all these mushrooms. I got to eat them. Oh my gosh. Yeah, very cool. All right, so we'll just do this as, as many as you can for the time you have. We yeah, know you're yeah. a busy working doctor, and I guys, I'm going to ask them now in order they were received. Uh, the first one is from George. I'm a plant based whole food guy. Thanks, George. Light, latest labs show slightly high liver enzymes. My doctor said my diet caused these. Are the elevated enzymes sometimes false positive? Well, I mean, first off, first off, I mean, it is something to focus on. It's something to focus on. And in general, I recommend in this case uh, for liver enzymes, assume the worst that it is some sort of uh, something affecting your liver. Maybe it is most commonly is fatty liver disease where um, fat can be stored in your subcutaneous tissue. Fat can be stored in your organs too, believe it or not, and especially in the liver. So um, assume that it is fatty liver disease. Now, if your BMI is, you know, 25 or less, then you have to think about what else might be toxic to my liver. Now, 
in this day and age, we're being bombarded with supplements. And sometimes, you know, maybe that supplement is, is uh, you know, made in the garage of, of somebody's garage and it has a lot of lead or something. You know, sometimes when my patients have had uh, unexplained liver abnormalities, we start to go on a supplement diet and we start, you know, peeling things off. Um, some supplements, even if they are not um, adulterated with some sort of heavy metal, might actually be highly... Um, uh, not toxic, but your body's responding to it. The liver's job is to detoxify um, everything. And so now I will give you some good news. The liver is so strong. It is like the strongest organ in the body. I think you could even, you know, cut half of your liver off or, or something. You know, I've heard, heard crazy stories where people have had liver damaged uh, and, and, and survived. And if you think about alcoholics, how all their life, they're drinking, 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 just destroying their liver. And, and, and most of the time, honestly, the liver bounces back. So if you just have mild liver elevations, um, it's something to take note of and something to monitor, but in general, it, it's not a, um, it's not like a terminal diagnosis or anything. Um, you can simply monitor it and take note of the potential toxins that you are, um, that you have. Now you can rule out fatty liver disease with an ultrasound, a simple non-invasive test, uh, of the, of the liver. And, uh, that can, that can help. And that might be part of the workup. If you think you have any risks for hepatitis, you could get that done. Sometimes if you exercise a lot, I had a patient who did a 24 hour roller skating event, like the day before their, uh, their, their blood. And he basically had heat injury, uh, heat injury markers on his liver. Uh, a couple of days later, it was gone. So there, there can be, uh, when you look at the list it's a long list of things that could potentially bump your liver enzymes. The time to really worry if they get like three, four, five times their normal. If it's just slightly over the edge, it's usually that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Thank you. NAFLD. Right. <laughs> which actually Dr. Hanna Kalyova of PCRM did some research and it can be uh, actually reversed with a uh, low fat whole food plant-based diet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is amazing. Not a question, but a nice comment from Rick, who I'm guessing is your patient. I've been vegan, SOS, SOS free. It's going to drive me crazy for 18 months. Still fighting cholesterol and triglycerides. He is helping me a lot. He's really what you see. Really good guy. So that's very nice. A testimony. Yay, thanks, Rick. This is a really good general question on labs from Kathy. She says, should you stop your supplements before you get your labs done? Yes. And I would encourage you to uh, Google this uh, because, you know, there's so many, there's so many supplements that's hard, but one sort of classic one is biotin. Biotin is what a lot of people not proven, definitely not proven, but a lot of people will take it for nails and hair. Uh, and it really messes up the uh, lab results. Uh, so definitely you want to get your labs oftentimes fasting and you definitely want to avoid, avoid your supplements. For biotin, it's seven days beforehand. So uh, that, you know, time and money and energy, getting the lab test done, do a Google check on your um, specific compound uh, to see if it if affects the labs. But uh, biotin is the one that's kind of infamous. Thank you. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, where'd it go? Um... Hmm. Yes, here it is, Jasmine. My doctor wants to recheck my B12 level with supplementation. How soon before the recheck do I not to do I need to stop taking B12 to avoid a falsely elevated result? That's a good question. I, I think I wouldn't take it the directly before. I wouldn't take it directly before, but uh, it's I think it's reasonable to take it the day the day before, as far as I know. As far as I know, okay. the, the key with that one. Mm -hmm. the, the confusing thing with that one is how long does it take to drive your levels up? And um, I would wait about six weeks. Nice. Um, do you do some Q and A's somewhere? Cause somebody's mentioning that in the chat. I used to have Wednesdays. I used to have uh, vegan primary care live on Wednesdays, but I, it's been a long time since I've done this. And uh, I just basically, you know, my, my patient load has increased uh, you know, the words getting out there about vegan primary care and it, it just didn't make sense for me to continue because, um, Wednesdays is one of my big 
in-person days uh, in in uh, Dunedin, Florida. So uh, in, instead of doing the lives, I've just been seeing the patients in person. Thank you. And we appreciate you doing this live once a month. Joy says, what are some of the symptoms of B12 deficiency? The the it's it's they're vague. That's the problem. The B12 deficiency is kind of vague. The uh, what if, if patients have uh, fatigue or numbness and tingling or mental fog, this is one of the things I want to make sure that the, if 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 they are new to me or they've never tested B12, that is one of the things I'll test. But uh, they there is you know it, it can be neurologic, it can be psychologic. Um, there are kind of horror stories about in vegan families about patients who were avoiding uh, supplementation and then having problems with the children if they were uh, B12 deficient, and then they can have um, uh, developmental delays and this kind of thing. So if you do have children who are vegan, make sure you do the sprays, the, the B12 sprays. How come spray? Or sprays or gummies, you know, it's just the biggest thing whenever you're prescribing something to for children, it's like you have to actually get it in their body. <laughs> so uh, whether it's a spray or a gummy, I tend not to recommend the gummies just because it sounds too much like candy. And I don't like to associate candy with the health, health yeah. as a health food. Thank you. Um, Richard Hubbard says, hello. Hey, Richard. He's been on the show several times, two or three, I believe. Susan says, my TSH has always been low. It's not an accurate marker for whether thyroid meds are needed. The free three and the free T4 as well as thyroid antibodies give a more accurate. Okay. This is a statement, not a comment, I think, but, uh, but maybe you can address that because, you know, people worry about those numbers so much. And what I don't like and tell me, cause you know, I'm, I mean, it's so funny because I'm so old. We were talking about this. We had a brunch for our new 99 year old doctor friend who is the, got the number one spot on my channel. We were talking about house calls because, you know, he's been, a, he's almost a hundred. So he's been a doctor longer than anyone. And I still remember having house calls as a young child, you know, until they stopped, which is, you know, was in the sixties, uh, later sixties. And nowadays when you, you know, I remember going to the doctor, like if you have a physical and they would uh, sometimes order the labs in advance. So that when you're there, the doctor could go over them with you or you'd make another appointment. Now, at least in the health systems that I'm part at in California, they send you your results by text and email. And then you might get them at seven o'clock on a Saturday night, but there's nobody to call. And then you see these abnormal results with no explanation. And then you just worry about it, you know? And I, I don't think we should be, the patient should be given their results without somebody to explain them personally. Well, I mean, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do, why this made sense to do this kind of talk. Um, I, I know there's still more thing, you know, this is, you know, maybe we'll do part two and, you know, really delve deeper. Um, but yeah, this is this is something I actually got to do uh, house calls in the military. I was on this little small base in um, Yuma, Arizona, out in the middle of the desert. And I got to actually go to my patients' um, houses, kind of like uh, old school doctors. So it was it was really a great experience. And uh, but I'm actually glad this person brought up the idea of, of thyroid um, because a lot of patients will come and they'll say, well, you know, you got to get the T3 and the reverse T3 and, and this and that. And uh, uh, because you hear about it uh, and, you know, in general, I'm down, I'm what I call down to clown, you know, I'm down to order these extra things. Uh, one of the problems though, is how do you interpret it? Just like with the glucose testing, the glucose could be up and down, up and down. Well, how do you kind of get a sense of what the average has been? And that's like that hemoglobin A1C, you get an average, uh, a good slow moving number, a slow moving target. Well, the thyroid, the T3, T3, it gets uh, metabolized so quickly, so quickly, so that when things go up and then they come back down and there's this high amount of daily variation, that if you get the test, you don't know if at the time you're up here or you're down here. I like to use the analogy of a merry-go-round. If you're on a merry-go-round and you take a picture, bink, is it here or is it over here? You know, a second later, it was over here. And so um, T3 ends up being too uh, variable to honestly make, um, because when you make a thyroid dose adjustment, you may not see that patient again for six weeks or three months, and they would have a, a potentially wrong dosage. So 
what we do is we monitor TSH and we make the T4 adjust, the free T4, um, the thyroid medicine adjustment based on the TSH. And then we use it if we, if patients want to have both T4 and T3, which is starting to become more popular, where you're getting both thyroid hormones, that you base the T3 hormone on the percentage of the T4 hormone. So um, that is how I manage it. It's, I believe this is the way the American Endocrinological Society recommends uh, that, it, that it's, it's done. But if there are other providers doing things differently, I, I mean, I've, I've, let me know. Uh, and, and, and if it makes sense, we'll, we'll do it. But this is my understanding so far of the thyroid. Thank you. Uh, Kathy says A slash G ratio is high at 3.1%. A is 4.7 and G is 1.5. What does this mean? I don't even know what the AG ratio is. Right. So uh, what she's talking is the albumin globulin ratio. And I kind of glossed over this a little bit in the, in the, the talk. Um, that's because the proteins and the albumins and the globulins, they get, uh, they oftentimes I, I find it difficult to get clinical information from them. Now, I tend to almost gloss over them or ignore them unless I have a reason to look, what we call the pre-test probability. Pre-test probability. Are you expecting that there is a problem with the liver protein productions, is albumin? And, and uh, if we're not expecting it and there's no other signs of liver disease, no liver enzyme abnormalities, no history, then we kind of say, oh, it's just a glitch. We'll retest, uh, you know, if we, if we're, re if it's really off the charts, we retest, but many times you'll get this albumin and globulin ratio, uh, coming up as abnormal because one of the tests is abnormal and it affects the ratio. And so then it'll, it'll come up abnormal. I call these secondary tests, these secondary, they're not a primary test. I would con consider the liver enzymes more primary. Like we look at that first. And if they're abnormal, then we're looking at other signs of liver dysfunction. These secondary tests like albumin globulin ratio are, are more esoteric and, and, uh, and, and so they're easier to gloss over, honestly. Great, thank you. Here is a question from Susmita. Hi, Susmita, how are you? Are there any labs that you suggest people get tested if they have hair loss off after going plant-based? I'm gonna post a link in the chat, Susmita, of an episode I did with Dr. Joel Furman, where he talks about um, telogen effluvium. He talked about why people, uh, when they change their diet, lose hair. And I'm gonna post the link right now. I, I would love that. I, I need to look at that. Um look at that talk because, you know, this is so distressing for patients, you know, hair loss. And it really feels like you're out of control because you're like, what can I do? What can I do? And as a doctor, I feel oftentimes kind of powerless to help patients because it can be very difficult. It can be very difficult to test and uh, for, and it can be very difficult to kind of tr point at the trigger, the smoking gun. Uh, and hair loss can be, because it's so uh, vague in terms of the workup and the treatments that natural remedies and supplement providers will really use this one as a, as a, um, a, uh, a selling point. Oh, it improved your hair and this and that. So far, I haven't found any um, evidence-based uh, uh, supplemental treatments. And I mentioned biotin and some people mention collagen and this kind of stuff. I don't really recommend those things. Some people say, oh, it's zinc. Oh, it's selenium. It's not evidence-based, not evidence-based. Um, in fact, zinc and selenium and other heavy metal type things, you can have a, a U-shaped curve in terms of toxicity, meaning you want to be in the sweet spot and you don't want to be too high because being too high with these uh, supplements can cause hair loss too. So I haven't seen the talk by Dr. Furman but he might have been talking the life cycle of the hair and the, um, the base of the hair. And patients can have traumatic events in their lives. Uh, they can have stressful events. They can have a trauma. Or you can have things like you could go through menopause or you could go, you know, you've done a prolonged fast or you, you know, um, have delivered a baby and you have huge hormonal shifts and this kind of thing. And then you'll get a hair loss event that happens months later. 
And you, you'll be left wondering, what the heck happened? Why am I losing hair all, all of a sudden? And it can be quite distressing. And so I, um, we kind of go over these things. And a lot of times I'm trying to do a time capsule. I'm trying to figure out if people had a highly traumatic event that occurred months prior. Also, uh, this, the weight loss is a factor. I know Susmita lost, I believe, 30 or 40 pounds. And sometimes the weight loss and the speed of weight loss, I've heard a lot, they lose hair sometimes, but it, it should grow back. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, now there are, there are things like autoimmune issues like alopecia areata, where there'll be a part, uh, a round patch or something that will come out. Uh, there's also kind of male pattern baldness, but just this uh, testosterone pattern baldness. And so you can have a receding hairline and this and that, even in females. And so there can be some, you know, hormones that we can monitor and check, but a lot of times this is even kind of un, it's hard to pick up and it's, it can be related to genetic, genetic, you know, history, how members in the family, did they have issues with hair, hair, how's their hair pattern at, at this age and that kind of thing. Um, there are medicines that you can try for, for hair loss. Um, but the, and you know, listening to Dr. Greger's nutritionfacts.org uh, videos, uh, he talks about um, pepitas, the pumpkin seeds as some actual plant-based kind of remedy. And so I'll mention that to people as well. Make sure you include some pumpkin seeds with, if right. you're concerned about hair loss. Yeah. I've heard pumpkin seeds are good for that. Beth says, has the omega-3 DHA EPA testing become more reliable? Is it unreliable? Was it unreliable? Yes. Yes. And this is kind of a hot topic, a gray area, a gray zone. Um, you'll have some folks that you'll hear, you know, some influencers talk about omega-3 as the, you know, the panacea. And some pay people will say, well, you know, we do know that high dose omega-3s is associated with prostate cancer and some of these prolonged population studies. And so this is a hotbed. And I'm not sure I know of the, the, the perfect answer here, but like, for instance, Dr. Furman recommends omega-3 index testing and making sure you're over a certain number. I believe it's five, but he higher, higher is better. Uh, and to take algae-based DHA uh, and uh, EPA and DHA to get your numbers up. And, uh, uh, but the omega index is variable, a variable. And so what I just do is I just recommend that if you want to do omega index, that you get it from the same company uh, for a pre and post treatment. And so that's kind of how you get around that a little bit. The, uh, the variability uh, of different labs doing it different ways. They even report it differently. So then you're reading one omega-3 and reading the different, and then and it's confusing and you're doing, trying to do calculus on the, uh, on the numbers. And so the key there is to just get it from the same company. Uh, uh, I use Quest. Quest has an omega index uh, that that's really easy to understand. Nice. Thanks. Uh, Richard says, is, do you, does he have to worry if platelet count is low? That was the first thing you said that vegans generally have lower platelet and lower WBCs, right? Right, right. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, there's low and then there's really low. And then there is like bruising low, spontaneous bruising and this kind of thing. Now, um, I'm not looking at the numbers, but it's something like if you're over 100, you're usually okay. Uh, and under 150, I believe, is considered low. Something, something like that. Uh, and and vegans can tend to be on, on the low side, uh, and that that can be that can be normal for 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 vegan. But believe it or not, B12 does cause it to go low as well. So you just want to make sure that B12 is um, is adequate. Uh, you could double check with the homocysteine or methylmalonic acid. But uh, if all that is normal and you have um, you don't have uh, ITP or these uh, autoimmune related platelet um, uh, issues, then you just follow it. You just follow it, especially if you haven't had spontaneous bruising uh, uh, of any more particular degree than normal, then you, you just, you just kind of watch it. But um, yeah, mild, mild platelet abnormalities are very typical in, um, in vegans because it's real, it's a, it's a marker of inflammation, believe it or not. Uh, so low levels of inflammation, low platelets. Interesting. Uh, Karen says, what are the most important labs for a diabetic in remission? Is, ins is it insulin level or C-reactive protein? Which is more important? 
Well, uh, you know, if you're if you're in remission, you can use the standard tests: uh, glucose and hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C is my favorite diabetic test because you get the average blood sugar. We've kind of already mentioned that a couple times uh, today. And then if you notice your blood sugar going up, then you know you may also have a problem with insulin. Uh, so. Uh, once, if you find that you're starting to lean into uh, having higher blood sugars, despite doing the right thing, eating a low fat, high fiber diet, then you can also do these insulin and C-peptide tests. C-peptide is like, if you imagine, if you imagine uh, insulin as, uh, as this bottle, the C-peptide is the bottle cap. And uh, so, you know, if you have bottle caps, you knew there were, uh, there were bottles around. And um, that's because insulin can be variable and, and, and C-peptide, the bottle caps, can tell you whether you have native production of insulin. And if your native production of insulin is going down, you might be leaning into type one diabetes, uh, which could be where the pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin. So re, you know, just to recap, you can follow it with normal glucose and, uh, and hemoglobin A1C, uh, and, then, and then get into those other tests if, if that pops up. Okay. Uh, Angelus, uh, and by the way, you tell me when to stop. I, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of questions we can do these next month. I will just keep asking until you tell me to stop. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I don't have any more special guests, you know, my mushrooms. I, okay. I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> all right. Uh, Angelus, <laughs> Angelus says, what kind of lab work may be helpful for someone who suffers with an extreme vertigo Meniere, Meniere's disease? Hmm, yeah. Oh man, many years disease can be very tough. Very tough. I, I, I recommend having a um, an ENT doctor on the team, uh, uh, an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Uh, sometimes a neurologist. Um, but uh, lab work is usually not part of the workup. You know, you can do basic labs just to make sure there's not a um, significant um, electrolyte disturbance. But um, as far as I know, they're, they're, this is not uh, directly testable with labs. Okay, great. This is about LP. Okay, uh, Jocelyn says whole food plant-based, no oil compliant for about 12 months. At my doctor, in my physical in January, my lipoprotein little a was high and my LP PLA activity is excellent. Is there a correlation and what does that mean? Okay, well, this is good. So we do know that lipoprotein A correlates with additional risk, additional risk. So it's kind of like, instead of getting a golden star, you're gets like a scarlet letter in a way. I mean, it's gonna, it's a little bit more risk for, for you. And uh, it's, it's standard across your lifespan. So we know that it will be with you. So, but not to fear, you've had these other tests too that are talk about inflammation in the, in the um, vascular inflammation. And so you can, it doesn't mean if you have LP little a that you actually have heart disease or that you have atherosclerosis. It, does, it doesn't mean that. It, I like to make sure my patients know this so that they um, can feel even additional motivation to, to be healthy. You know, it says, hey, I can't let myself go. I can't just, um, uh, I, I have to be more vigilant. And so they're going to come out with medicines that treat LP little a. And I know that patients had mentioned uh, niacin and stuff like that before, like in, in some of the other talks. It is true. Niacin, niacin is uh, one of the treatments. But typically the way, if, if, if you do have LP little a, you want to make sure that all your risk factors are managed. Uh, so you don't want to smoke. You want to make sure your blood sugar is really low. You don't want to be sedentary. Uh, you want to make sure and watch out for your blood pressure, manage your stress. And if you have high cholesterol, you want to lean on the side of treatment. And so, you know, Dr. Harrington, I'm trying to avoid a bunch of pills and potions on patients, but we still have the ability to use uh, the, the modern tools out there. So, I mean, there are statins, there are Zetia, this is a, a follow-up to statins, and then there's PCSK9 inhibitors. There's like the space age monoclonal antibody medications. And so there, we have lots of tools. And then we also have the um, plant uh, type products, the, the plant sterols. Uh, there are um, omla powder. 
there's a uh, berberine, bergamot. There's lots of things we can try. And this is one of the things patients come to me. Sometimes they have high cholesterol. They don't want to use statins. And we, we try to get it down with these other, other methods. Thank you. Uh, how do you improve ferritin if it's low and what problems are associated? All right. Ferritin. I love this question because standard sort of stuff for a non-vegan doctor is it's almost like I gotcha. It's like, I gotcha. Maybe they'll do the complete blood count, but they'll throw in a ferritin and they'll be like, see, your ferritin is low. Your iron stores are low. Clearly you're vegan and you're low. And uh, this is the problem. Well, it's actually not a problem. And by the way, uh, iron stores might be a marker of additional inflammation. Uh, iron is somewhat toxic. So, so much so that if you supplement with, if you supplement with, with iron, the body will actually try to uh, have less absorption uh, of iron. It'll, it'll, it'll try to fight the absorption. So some, you have to actually trick the body and sometimes do it every other day for the absorption of iron. So um, uh, the question is that if you have low iron stores, I'm not so concerned about that as long as you are not anemic. So you get the complete blood count, a primary test, primary test, and it shows the hemoglobin hematocrit. If you're not anemic and you have enough red blood cells, there's no need to worry so much about your actual ferritin level. I don't care if you have iron in the cupboard as long as the children are fed, basically. I love that. <laughs> That's a good, I like your saying what you just said. That's really great. That's clever. Uh, Colleen says, do you feel the same about T4 and T3 supplementation for a total thyroidectomy patient? Right. So um, the uh, endocrine societies came out and for years, the endocrine societies were like, look, just use T4, just use T4, T4. Um, I mean, and back in the day, I mean, they were using like desiccated thyroid and stuff like that all the time. And, uh, um, you know, pork, pork thyroids dried up and uh, that would give you both T3 and T4. Um, but the, the, the vegan, I mean, the um, endocrine societies finally came out and said, I guess, I guess we could try to use T4 and T3 if the patient wants to do that. And that's because some of the studies, when they came out and they used both products, um, there was a better, um, uh, the patients felt better. The patients felt better on the, the having both T4 and T3. So if my patients are interested in doing that, or they don't, they don't feel right, even though the TSH is in the appropriate level, but they're feeling fatigued, they're feeling cold, or they're, um, they're having constipation, even though they are, you know, vegan and eating 50 grams of fiber and this kind of thing, then we'll add the T3. The problem with the T3 is kind of annoying because you have to take it a lot of times twice a day versus the T4 is a, it's once a day, once a day preparation. I don't recommend desiccated uh, thyroid products. I'm vegan. And so I recommend the synthetics, uh, but um, uh, yeah, yeah. The, and, and we can do it. We can do it if you want and, and we'll work it out. Thank you. Uh, so I am, this is a, a live viewer putting in the chat. I am vegan. My 16 hour fasting sugar is 119. Some days it was a hundred. Does this mean I'm pre-diabetic or is it something I ate the previous day? I love this. This is great. You know, uh, we're all, we should all be kind of thinking about our blood sugar. We should all be thinking about our blood sugar and getting it down. And I love that you're thinking about the circadian rhythms uh, and this kind of thing, because it has a big effect. It has a big effect. So once again, blood sugar management, we want to get that hemoglobin A1C because it gives us, it's a lie detector test or it just kind of blasts through the, the fog. You know, you see this number, it's an average of what your average blood sugar is. So hemoglobin A1C, the, the rusted cars or the sugared blood cells gives you that answer. Um, but yeah, try to back it off a little bit at night, eat, eat a little bit uh, earlier in the day. I try to tell patients if the sun goes down, it's just time for herbal tea. That's it. That's all you get, herbal tea. Because we know that 100 calories in the morning versus 100 calories at night is a lot more uh, obesogenic. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, tape it to your thighs kind of thing. You know, it's a, that when you eat at night, your body kind of turns it into fat at a higher rate. 
Yeah. You know, it's interesting how, uh, how what you eat can affect your blood test. Do you, do you remember the, the story that Dr. Clapper told when he was an anesthesiologist and he had to draw the labs himself? And then like, it was like just this white cloudy stuff. And he said, what did you eat? And he goes, Oh, a cheeseburger. You know, it really does show up in the blood, doesn't it? I, I love that story. I, I love that story. Yeah. Cause I, I, I remember, um, you know, I'm not a phlebotomist, but I remember, you know, working with the lab there as a residency, as a resident and uh, seeing the different vials of, uh, and you would see uh, some that have like this coat of, of, uh, of, of fat, you know, you'd be like, oh my gosh. So you'll see very, a, a wide difference among the, uh, the blood. I remember once um, I'm vegan and um, my, we had a pet sitter, we were away and she had fed my dog something like an in and out burger. And the next day he had to go for labs and the vet said, I've never seen cholesterol this high in a dog. What do you feed him? And I'm like, well, I feed him what you tell me. And then we found out that she had fed him this. And it's amazing. You know, you're, 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 doesn't lie, does it? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. I know. I couldn't believe it. Oh my goodness. Let's see. This is a lot of fun, actually. I'm really enjoying this topic because it's so broad. You know, it's not like just one little, you know, not that I, I mind other things like autoimmune disease that, that that I don't have, but it's, it's, I think everybody has blood, right? And they, <laughs> so they get right. Right. everybody has, time to time, every, you know? everybody has a story of having things being a little bit off, a little bit off here or there and, and not getting great explanations. And, and, um, and so, yeah. Linda's uh, commenting that she had hair loss initially after going whole food plant-based and losing the first 33 pounds. It was alarming, but after six months, her hair came back and is now thick, healthy, and shiny. I hear that a lot. Thank you, Linda. Um, Melinda Thank wants you. to know, can you test uric acid at home? What is that and why would you want to test it anyway? Okay. Uh, uric acid uh, is a uh, uh, like a protein breakdown product. And it builds up, uh, as there's problems with excretion or problems with too much production. And if it gets too high, it can crystallize in your joints and cause gout. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, McDougall talks about it being the, the, the disease of the kings and queens, the disease of kings and queens. And uh, you, for people who have gout, you want to tell them, hey, you want to uh, eat a non-heme proteins, non-heme proteins, and you want to, you know, decrease animal products and fish. And they talk about beer and cheeses and, and different things like this. But yeah, you want to decrease, you want to go on a low protein diet, low animal protein diet, for sure. So I always, you, you talk about the analogy of rock candy, where you make a super saturated solution, you heat up the, the sugar water, uh, you see the crystals and they go into solution when it's hot. You put the string in and then as it cools down, the crystals form, they precipitate out of the solution. And that's what's happening with uric acid. The problem is those crystals, they look like little needles and they form in like your big toe or areas that are a little cooler. Uh, and so, oh my gosh. And it's pain like people describe as like pain like they've never heard of, I mean, had before. They can't walk and they look fine except, oh my gosh, their toe is really swollen. So to answer the question about whether you can get labs at home, I don't think so. If somebody sees it online, if they Google it and they see it, put it in the chat. Where, uh, but uh, more and more stuff is being able to be tested online uh, or, or through some sort of point of care test, but not, not that I've heard of. Um, you, that place called Direct Labs does have stuff like uric acid testing. They'll get you set up with a local lab and you could come, if you're, if you're my patient, of course, we could order uric acid testing. Um, but that's what I would tell you if you did have a history of gout is to definitely decrease your animal protein and uh, we can monitor uric acid. There are medicines that can help you increase excretion or um, uh, and help prevent gouty attacks if you're having them frequently. Nice. Thank you. Tracy says, I use a lot of spices and herbs when I cook. Will these affect lab outcomes like supplements? And should I back off on these before I have labs drawn? That's a good question. We kind of answered it a little before, uh, but because it's it's such a wide, um, th there could be a variety of different things and and plants are powerful. So yeah, you may want to stop for, a, a, you know, biotin is a classic one and that's for, you want to stop for seven days, seven days. But um, most of my patients who take supplements don't have liver abnormalities. Uh, and so, you know, it, 
you may want to go ahead and, and, and take your supplements. And then if you have abnormalities, you can double check, but because uh, chances are you probably wouldn't, wouldn't cause that. Um, but um, that's kind of, it's kind of up to you. Great. Thank you. I read an, an, another nice comment here about you. Where did it go about how knowledgeable you are? Um, and you uh, answer things in such a straightforward, easy to understand way. Thank you, Susanna, for that. Oh, thank you. Uh, Ellen says, I have polycystic ovarian ovary syndrome, and I've struggled with losing weight and dropping my cholesterol and BP meds. I've been eating a whole food plant-based diet for about two years. Why don't you make an appointment with Dr. Scott Harrington? All right. I think that'd be like perfect. Cause I think that's like kind of like, I think she needs more than just a quick uh, YouTube answer. Life, don't you? Yeah. Complete lifestyle type of um work, work, uh, certainly, certainly work on weight loss, but sometimes uh, folks with polycystic ovarian syndrome have normal BMI. And, um, then we like to get the endocrinologist, uh, on board. Yep. We're going to have one on the show. I think March 29th, actually, people have been asking for him to come back. And, uh, the quote, the comment from Susanna was Dr. Harrington is so knowledgeable and has such a great way of sharing this complicated information in a way that everyone can understand it. Like when you say, just, do you want to make sure that you feed the kids in the cup? I don't know what you said, but I remember that was very, very <laughs> for, for iron, if for iron storage molecule ferritin, I don't care so much about the iron in the cupboard. What you have stored is whether the kids are fed and you're not anemic, you have it. enough red blood cells. Yep. Oh, yeah, I love it. I understand things when they're like less medical. Uh, somebody's <laughs> just saying my A1C is six. That That's high, correct? That is high. Over 5.7 is considered pre-diabetic. Now you're not diabetic, but the specter of diabetes is always kind of looming for all of us, really. We're, you know, we're always trying to keep it at bay. So this, this should give you uh, additional pause uh, to, uh, to kind of jump, head start your, uh, your lifestyle for a healthy lifestyle increasing exercise and, and eating a high fiber, low fat diet. Yeah. Uh, Morgan says my LDL was 190 in September of 2018. I changed to a whole food plant-based diet and four years in my LDL sits at 117. Do I need to strive forever for a lower one? Or is this the best my genetics can offer even eating healthfully? Well, I mean, First off, congratulations. 190, 190 is the do not pass go, uh, do not collect $200 number for LDL. If you see a patient with 190, you, you, the doctors are trained, put them on a statin, they'll never get it down. But you did, you did, you went on a plant-based diet and you got it down and 119 or something like that is, it's not rock bottom, but that is what's very interesting. You know, I thought when I became vegan and I'd be a vegan doctor that, that all my patients would have like this rock bottom cholesterol, but our bodies produce a lot of cholesterol. They, they, they you know, uh, we don't have to consume it. It's only 25% of our, of our um, cholesterol is from, from dietary cholesterol intake. Um, the rest is how your body genetically deals with it and how you, uh, the fiber that you eat, whether you're passing cholesterol through, from the bile. And so the question is, do I, do I have to do anything else to get it down? Well, we do have a tool. The American College of Cardiology has the, the, the risk tool. And if your risk is over 10%, you can Google this, you know, cardiac risk calculator, and you can put your numbers in and um, it's free and you can put your numbers in. If you have your own blood pressure cuff, you get your blood pressure, you put in your age and your uh cholesterol numbers. And it'll tell you if you're over 10%, they recommend some type of treatment in, in statins is number one, what they would recommend. But there, you know, if, 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 it, if you're over 10%, maybe you work with your doctor on, on other supplements and retesting. If you're 7.5% or over, and you have these other risk factors like elevated high sensitivity CRP or things like, um, lipoprotein A elevation, then you want to be more aggressive. You want to be more aggressive, but it sounds like with those numbers that you wouldn't require any treatment. Nice. Here's a question from Linda. My serum protein level tends to be on the low end, 6.1 or lower. Is that a result of being vegan or does that point to some other issue? Well, you know, I mentioned here about glossing over these protein, albumin, and globulin tests. Uh, but you have to look, you have to use gestalt, you know, you have to take a look at the patient. 
I have a large subset of my patients are actually underweight. They're underweight. Their vegan ninja skills are been so strong, so highly strong, and their their ability to restrict away uh, you know fatty foods have been so strong that they have started to become underweight. And when you start to become underweight, you can have some of these abnormalities with uh, the liver producing enough proteins and this kind of thing. And people can develop, um, they can develop uh, swelling because the proteins that the liver produce are like a sponge for holding on to the fluid in your, in your vessels. These proteins that act like a sponge. And so um, we have to kind of look at the whole picture. If you're a normal weight and uh, there's no liver, liver problems, I would suspect this is a spurious finding. I, I probably wouldn't look into it too deeply. But if you are on sort of on the lower uh, body weight, underweight sort of concern for malnourishment, then I would be kind of more concerned and I'd be, I'd be trying to get you back to a normal weight. Right. Um, I, don't, I don't think she's underweight. Um, so she's, uh, yeah, interesting. But doctors that are not vegan do worry about any little tiny thing, don't they? Well, yeah, I mean... Uh, it's, uh, you, you don't want to be neglectful. <laughs> you don't right. want to neglect your patients for sure. All right. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. What a popular topic and a, a very, uh, we haven't discussed this on the channel, so I really appreciate it. All right. Uh, thanks for the feedback, Chef AJ. Once again, I really enjoy being here and uh, I look forward to next month. Right. And uh, have a great, safe trip on the holistic holiday scene. When you come back next month, we'd like to hear all about it from you. All right. I can't wait. Yeah. Don't show any more of those scary mushrooms. We're going to have nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> They're crazy, right? I'm, I'm, I got to really psych myself up to eat them. I'm just kidding. Thanks so much, Dr. <laughs> Harrington. It was a lot all of right. fun. Take care. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow. My guest is Dr. Joan Iflin. And my book is on sale on Amazon. And if you send your receipt to Chef AJ Bonus, regardless of when you bought it, we have a lot of great things for you, like extra recipes and even a recorded two-hour cooking class. Take care, everyone. Hope to see you tomorrow.